United with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation by KSCE Channel 38 Christian Television. And now, United with Christ. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you joined us this morning. My name is Daniel Saddlemeyer. I'm pastor at Cross Point Church here on the east side of El Paso, across from Montwood High School. And we want to talk today about how culture is changing and how our message as Christians needs to change too. Joining me, I have a special guest uh, today, is uh, Kerry Boone. And Kerry uh, is on staff at our church. He does youth ministry as well as our worship uh, ministry. And uh, Kerry is studying uh, for the ministry himself and going to be a pastor one of these days. And uh, so uh, we want to dig right into it today. You know, uh, things are different than they used to be. And by the way, we do have a prayer line, 532-8518. So feel free to call in your prayer needs, and there are people standing by to pray with you. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear, Carrie, to everybody that uh, things have changed. Um, some things I was thinking about uh, this week, how we have changed, is our view of the Bible. You know, we have always considered ourselves a Christian nation in America, but now we live really in a post-Christian environment, which means that we don't have the same values, the same values that we used to have. And they were mostly based on the Bible. You know, for, for centuries, even people who were not believers still respected the Bible and its values. And a couple of things that I've thought about was our view of the Bible. I just read recently a uh, survey that was done called The Most Bible-Minded Cities in America. And uh, El Paso is number 51 in that list. We're, we're quite a ways down in the list. And Bible-Minded Cities is defined as those who report reading the Bible in the past week and who strongly assert the Bible is accurate in the principles it teaches. And nationally, only about 25%, one-fourth of Americans uh, consider themselves Bible-minded. So in other words, three-fourths of Americans really don't consider the Bible and its values very authoritative in their life. Another thing I think has changed is our view of marriage. Certainly as a pastor, I've seen that. Uh, many years ago when I got into the ministry, I think generally it was accepted that uh, marriage was between a man and a woman. And uh, it was an important, uh, important event in people's lives. And it was important to be married. But now, of course, with the Supreme Court ruling recently, uh, uh, gay marriage has been legalized in America. The definition of marriage is really uh, quite different. And even, I think, a lot of people's view of marriage, uh, um, if you weren't legally married, uh, you knew that you weren't keeping up with what I think society generally felt was right in marriage. But now I think most uh, people, a lot of people that come to me for marriage, are living together and really don't feel it's anything wrong with that. That's almost the norm, is living together. In fact, why get married? My, my parents were both divorced, and uh, it didn't work out. All my friends have been through divorces, so let's just try it. You know, Let's just live together for a while, and if we feel like getting married, we will. If not, it just uh, works out better for everyone, and it's easy in, easy out. And so our view of marriage, our view of life, when does life begin? I think generally uh, we've felt as Americans that there was a respect for life and for the unborn. Of course, that's all changed now since Roe versus Wade. And one of the things I was thinking about, Carrie, is that we almost are, have more laws against cruelty to animals than we do to cruelty to babies. Uh, I mean, we can take the, uh, an unborn baby's life and think nothing of it. But, you know, if uh, I think uh, just reading about Houston, there's some lawsuits or, or some people arrested for leaving their dogs out in the hurricane. And uh, boy, you know, it's just kind of a, a different way of looking at life. A view of the church, I think, has changed uh, today. How we view the church is certainly a lot more suspicion of the church. Church, I think, was looked at for many years and even centuries as kind of a, a place that you respected, didn't always understand it, maybe didn't always attend, but you still valued it in the community. And now the church is 
you know, more or less kind of full of a bunch of hypocrites and why bother with it? It's kind of a closed club and a clique. And then finally, view of truth, I think, has changed. You know, there's always been a, a view in America for many years that there is an absolute truth. Or there is truth and there's falsehood. But now I think, uh, especially in your generation, that's all changing and truth is, is relative. Um, National Geographic recently on their cover issue uh, had a um, title called Our Complicated Relationship with the Truth. And I thought that was so funny. What, what's so complicated about truth? Either something's true or not. But no, we see truth differently. So, uh, but the one thing, uh, and then I want to bring you in on this, is Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so even though society changes, cultures change, God's word and the truth of the gospel doesn't change. So Amen. let's, uh, I, I want to bring you in on this, uh, Kerry. Um, you were kind of a rock and roller, um, excellent guitarist, and really wanted to live your life for maybe doing professional musician uh, kind of stuff. But somewhere God intersected with your life and changed all that, and now you're studying for the ministry. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Sure. Um, before I begin today, too, I, I just want to say for anyone watching at home, Jesus loves you. Hmm. Uh, the thing you're going through is temporary. God can purpose your pain. You may not have a perfect situation or a perfect plan, but you have a perfect Savior. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you in that today. I think for my story, um, when I really thought about what's the overall theme of my testimony, I think that's the power of being in fellowship with the church. Hmm. And so um, as I look back through my life, yeah, my dream and my goal, my desire was to be a famous guitar player. <laughs> you know, growing up, I had Jimi Hendrix and Van Halen, all those guys on my wall. Um, and my dream was, yeah, I want to be, at, someday I want some kids somewhere in America to have me on, uh, in a poster <laughs> on their wall. And that was the dream. That's what I wanted. That was my goal. And, um, you know, luckily enough, you know, my dad's a was a professional guitar player, and he kind of started jamming with you. My pastor is an amazing organ player, by the way. Um, started jamming, and so they kind of got involved in church. And so I think I came to Crosspoint when I was about 11 and um, was around church. Most of my best friends that, that I still have in my life today were from that early, like the early beginnings at church in the youth group at the time. And uh, so... So even though my focus for most of my life was on uh, bringing glory and attention to myself through music, um, God used the relationships I built within our church to slowly change my heart, change my life over time. Even my wife, uh, I met her at youth group, <laughs> and um, we have a baby on the way in November, and um, she has certainly changed my heart. And I, I remember one sad time I came off a, a gig, and... Um, I'm not proud to admit this, but, you know, I came off and, and I wanted to make out with her. And I was like, don't you want to kiss me? Because I'm so cool. I was playing. And she was like, no. you're." And so, um, you know, God has really humbled me through her mm -hmm. and uh, just really blessed my life. And so I think just being in fellowship in church, uh, the church has uh, really given me foundation in my life that I didn't even know was there. And would eventually uh, just having those relationships and connections with people are what brought me really into the light of Christ and into uh, rather than focus on bringing glory and attention to myself, bringing glory and attention to, to the Lord. So what you're saying is as bad mouth uh, we, we do, uh, the, the things we say about the church, God still uses the church. No, it definitely it's, does. Uh, yeah, it's still important in society. So. It's, it's very important. I'd encourage any of you at home, uh, reading your Bible, being in personal relationship with Jesus is great. But the other part of it is you need to be in relationship and fellowship with other believers. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about the church. The church makes a difference. Uh, Jesus Amen. works through the church. So get involved. You can come to our church mm -hmm. or any other church. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Go where God leads you. But uh, get involved. Get plugged in. It will change your lives in, in, in radical ways. Amen. Uh, Kieran, let's talk about um, you're a millennial. Um, yep, I got my Starbucks and my <laughs> plaid shirt. So. <laughs> How has uh, the culture changed in your understanding and your observation? Yeah, I think certainly what you're saying about truth. I think to me, truth is if something's true, it's absolute, mm -hmm. you know. But I think the way 
culture looks at truth today is that we all have our own individual truth. And so I hear this a lot from my peers is that you live, I'm living my truth. So that Jesus guy, that might work great for you, but, but my thing that I do, that's what works for me. Mm -hmm. And all paths lead to the same thing. And I think there's kind of that idea where scripture says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so to me, that's, that's what the absolute truth is. Mm. And so what we need to do is be um, intentional about how we, we bring that truth into the lives of people. We, we have to be um, brave enough to stand on that when we mm. have these conversations and say, you know what, I respect where you're coming from. I, I see where you're coming from, but this is the truth. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think because there is truth in, in what God has said, that that, that that truth can pierce even the hardest of hearts. Mm. And so wow. uh, the other thing I see in youth culture today, I, I was trying to think of one word that describes a lot of the ministry I do with youth, and that would be helplessness. Mm. Um, I think, you know, when we step back and I, I see things on Facebook or older people kind of talking about the millennials and even the ones coming up now as kind of being entitled, uh, more in it for self. Um, but when I step back and look at that, I see the economic conditions a lot of, you know, us were raised in. We had that collapse of the economy and everything. Um, we see truth changing. Uh, we see a lot of kids in our youth group come from broken homes. Um, and, you know, they have single parents, and their parents are trying their best. But, you know, a lot of them don't have a father figure. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them just feel like no matter what they do, they're never going to get ahead in life. And so, mm -hmm. so that leads to a lot of things. It, it, it leads to them, this thing of entitlement, I, I think that's the wrong word. I think it's, it's a desperation. It, it's, it's looking for something mm -hmm. that they can tangibly have right. you know they feel like they haven't been given anything so they want things um and so when we step back we, we see that you know they have been faced with some hard realities in their life it, it's it's hard you know there's student debt all these things mm -hmm. and so they're facing right. all these pressures in life and a lot of them are working hard there's this perception that they're lazy a lot of them are working hard to try to pay those things down or get get ahead in life but just because of our economic reality it's just it's yeah. not happening so they have this despair and they have this hopelessness and so you know I, I think the way that you really reach out to people you can have a cool youth ministry program you can have uh, a cool church with with lights and smoke and I know we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit you can have all that stuff but at the end of the day what people are looking for is the hope and the good news of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and as long as Amen. You focus your ministry on that. That that message stays relevant through the ages. Mm. And so if you want to be relevant in your ministry, you want to speak to people the way Jesus did. Jesus always approached them in their context. So he would give the parable of the sower because they would understand that culturally, what was going on in their lives. And we need to do that. We need to become better storytellers. We need to look at what's happening in culture and say, okay, well, how can I take this and how can I... How can I speak to people? So I think in uh, overall, I'd say the climate of, of youth ministry and reaching out to, to young people, there's this feeling of hopelessness. So we need to say, well, what can we do to bring hope into that mm -hmm. situation? And mm -hmm. I always use Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, mm -hmm. plans to prosper you, not to word. harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That's my favorite verse, and uh, it's kind of the theme verse of our youth ministry. Yeah. Cool. Um, you talked about helplessness seems to be a word that summarizes uh, the younger generation today. Uh, talk about what are some of the biggest needs that you see uh, specifically in, in young people that you're uh, dealing with, that you're interacting with, uh, both in and out, outside of the church? Yeah, I, th I, think, um, I think number one is they're looking uh, for love. Hmm. They're looking to be accepted and loved. In our culture today, we have a competitive culture. Hmm. I win, you lose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're seeing the effects of that and what that does on, in, in a young kid's life. And so a lot of them, I think this, this feeling of despair, like they can't get ahead, that whatever they do, they can't win, I think comes from our competitive culture. It comes from uh, this, I, I'm going to get ahead, and it's, I'm all in it for me. 
I think that builds, it destroys community, first of all. And I think that mindset has even bled over into marriage and home situations. Uh, you, you see that marriage is on the decline. And so what that means is kids are, are growing up from broken homes. So they don't have a model of a good mom and, and dad and, and what it looks like when Christ is in the middle of a marriage. And so, you know, I think the way to effectively minister to these kids today is first they're looking to be loved and accepted. Mm. Uh, I feel like a lot of young people feel like they can't go to the church because they'll get, um, you know, They'll come in with their crazy hair or ripped jeans or mm-hmm. any of those kind of things, and people will look down on them and not, not right. want to include them. And so we need, to, we need to accept and love them where they're at and, mm-hmm. then, and then take them to where Jesus wants to bring them to. And uh, I think one way we really need to do that is if you look at any young person today, they've got this in their hands. <laughs> I mean, almost anywhere they go. I mean, I've got all my notes on it right now. Um, so if we're not utilizing this technology, mm. you know, we, we can say this is a hard time to be the church because church numbers are dwindling. Mm-hmm. Uh, the millennial generation is the largest unchurched generation, and, and the one coming up after us is going to be even more so. We can look at those things and get discouraged as the church, but I say what an opportune time mm. for ministry. I don't think there's ever been Amen. a more opportune time for you to be able to communicate effectively to your youth. You know, years and years ago, the only way you could maybe get a hold of them was through a landline phone. Now you've got all Facebook, uh, Twitter, Snapchat. And so we need to utilize that technology mm-hmm. to speak to them. So, so if they're on their phones as their youth pastor, I'm going to be on the phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, to the Jew, it became a Jew. To the Gentile, it yeah. became a Gentile. Yeah. To the teenager, it became a Snapchat user. You know, and so I'm going to use that to promote Christ because they're going to be on it. And when they're on it, they might as well be getting scripture, even if I'm annoying them, sending them stuff. (laughs) You know, they might as well be seeing that when they're on there than all the other things that are accessible to them. So I think this is a great time. The harvest is plenty. The workers are few, and who's going to do the work? We need to meet them where they're at. That's a great um, point. Yeah. Um, We're talking about young people. What would you say to some parents who are watching today uh, who have teenagers and maybe they're struggling to get connecting connected with their kids or maybe their kids are hanging out with people that they don't really appreciate or maybe there's just been something that's happened a rift has gotten between mom and dad and their a teenager uh, what would you what would you say yeah. uh, to, to moms and dads today I think um, one thing that was taught to me by one of our elders in the church, Toby Spoon, was that as a leader, and when you're a parent, you're a leader Mm -hmm. of your child's life, they cannot go wherever you're not willing to go. And so I would encourage you, if you're a parent, start spending time in your word. Uh, Get plugged into a church. You want to see God move in their lives, you got to have God moving in your life first. Mm -hmm. That's the legacy that you can pass down. So parents, I encourage you, you Pray for your kid. I know a lot of parents want their kids to be involved in youth group and stuff, but if you're not involved in church, then you're not modeling, modeling that for them. Mm-hmm. And we need to be, as leaders or parents, uh, we need to be willing to take the first step and, and, and direct the path. And so, and I would encourage you to, teenagers, they don't need you to be cool. They don't need you to understand all their references or jokes or lingo, all that stuff. They need love. Mm-hmm. And they need acceptance. And if, as long as you might not be the coolest parent, but who cares? You can be the parent that loves their kid mm-hmm. the most. Amen. And that's way more important. Yep. Cool. Let's talk about uh, worship because you wear a couple of hats. Uh, you are the worship leader in our church. Um, how do you see worship uh, today uh, as far as engaging the culture mm. uh, that we live in? Certainly, uh, there's been a lot of changes in the, in the way we do worship and the style of music, all those kinds of things. And, of course, that's not without some controversy, as change always sure. brings. But, but uh, as a millennial and as a worship leader and as a musician, uh, how do you see uh, the church needing to engage uh, our culture as far as worship goes? Sure. I, well, first, I think just as a church, 
we need to change our perspective. Uh, there's the worship wars, hymns mm -hmm. versus contemporary, mm -hmm. yeah. and that can get heated and debated. And I don't want to open that can of worms, but uh, we need to change our perspective. Uh, to me, I see uh, music, hymns, and contemporary, I see it all as one through line of history of mm -hmm. the church. And so a lot of, t you know, the ancient hymns, the ones that Luther made, all those things, they were, they were written in the style of the time. Mm -hmm and uh, even the instrumentation of the time, and they spoke to the culture then. Mm. And when we come to today, it's the same thing. We're taking the, the culture, the instrumentation of the time, but using it to point people towards Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see it as these two separate things. I just see it as, you know, the hymns and some of our ancient church music, that's, that's the foundation and, and people are always going to still be creative because mm -hmm. God's creative. So he's mm -hmm. created us to create. And so we're just uh, part of the lineage of that. And we're mm -hmm. continuing. And, and 30 years from now, it'll be different. And, mm -hmm. and 30 years from then, it'll be different. It's going to keep changing because culture is going to still change. But the heart of the gospel stays the same. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at a hymn or you look at a, at a modern worship song, that gospel message is still there. And as long as that's there, the other stuff doesn't matter so much because that thing always stays relevant. Our, our culture will change. And so I think as a church, we just need to be okay with, you know, there are places in America that the most effective way to reach the culture is through the organ and, and hymns and a choir. And then there's places in America where you're not going to do that. You need to have synthesizers and dance club beats mm -hmm. and all that because that's the culture that's around you. Yeah. And so you need to assess as a church what is going to effectively minister to people in my area? What are the people tuned into? Mm -hmm. And how can we use that to, to spread Christ into their right. lives? I know you used the analogy of um, some of the modern worship effects are kind of like the old stained glass windows in the uh, Middle Ages. Uh, explain that. Uh, yeah, so when you look through history, church was, um, for a lot of history, the pinnacle of art and creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the cathedrals, all these beautiful mm -hmm. expressions of, of art and artistry, and uh, they would build those beautiful stained glass windows as expressions of, of praise and worship onto God, trying to express the beauty of, mm -hmm. of our Creator. And, and we fast forward to today, you know, we have these, these debates about using lights or smoke or mm -hmm. uh, what the graphics we put up on screen, all that kind of stuff. But to me, again, I think, I think just like we do with hymns and worship, we need to look at it as a through line through mm -hmm. history. And so just as the church then was expressing and being the top pinnacle of art, I think the church today needs to be the top pinnacle of art because, mm -hmm. because we are the sons and daughters of God mm -hmm. and creation is, is one of God's chief mm -hmm. modes. And so if we're going to be like Christ, then we need to create and we need to push the envelope when it comes to expressing the beauty and the majesty of Christ. And so when we use lights or, or graphics within a worship set, it's not to emulate the world. It's not to emulate a concert because those, those lights and those graphics that a, that a secular band might use are being used to excite people. They're being used to make people think the guitar solo is extra awesome, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, but in the church, those things are used to convey the beauty and the majesty of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when a light, a, a motion light or a motion graphic is being used during worship in our context today, I see that the same thing as the, the early church builders who were making these beautiful uh, uh, artistic expressions mm -hmm. on the walls of the and ceilings of the cathedrals, mm -hmm. or um, through the stained glass. So right. I think it's all it's part of our heritage and our legacy as a church yeah. to be creative. That's true. When you think of uh, the great paintings uh, down through history, were all biblical themes, and the great music uh, mm -hmm. through the Middle Ages uh, were uh, glorifying. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach used to put uh, Deo uh, Gloria. Uh, glory to God on the bottom of every one of his uh, uh, oratorios because mm -hmm. he wanted to give great glory to God. Handel did the Messiah, you know, uh, took themes from the Bible. And so that's always been um, a, a correlation between the church and culture and bringing that news of Christ in a setting that would relate to the people yeah. of their day. Um, 
And you do a, a great job uh, in worship, that's for sure. Um, you know, we, we talk about uh, some things that we can do, but probably it boils down to, and I think you alluded to this, is having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we can do all kinds of things, and there's all kinds of opinions about music and styles. And, but it seems like maybe the most important thing we can do as Christians, wouldn't you agree, is live out consistently our life in such a way that uh, people will see a consistency with our message, uh, our talk with our walk, Amen. and see that's what's going to draw people. And Paul the Apostle said, you ourselves are our letters to be known and uh, read by all men, written not with ink but with the Holy Spirit, not on tablets of stone but on the tablets of human hearts, to be known and read by all men. And so I think it's so important, wouldn't you agree, that we live our lives in such a way that people see Christ within us. Amen. And so maybe you're watching today and you've never really opened your heart to Christ completely. Or maybe you are a person who is on the sidelines. You were involved in a church. You were involved in the ministry. Maybe you were involved in leadership. But something happened and you've gotten hurt or something took place and now you're sitting on the sidelines. And I guess what we want to encourage you to do is get reconnected with the Lord Jesus and get back into the game. Get back into the church. God needs people like you. But if you're here and you're just watching today and you're just feeling that helplessness, that loneliness, something's missing in your life, we want to invite you to allow Jesus to open your heart to a great future uh, because God has great things for every one of us. If we'll just let him in and let him do his supernatural thing within us, it's just amazing. He can do things we don't even realize he could do through us. So... Uh, let me just pray with you. And if you're watching and like to have Christ, just renew your life and come in. Let's just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, for giving me everything. And I just ask that you would open my heart to a whole new future. Thank you. Come in. Live within me. Change me. And I want to live for your glory. Forgive me of my sins. I want, Lord, you to have the glory in my life. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for watching. Thank you, Carrie, for your wonderful insights. And uh, get to church. If you don't have a church, try to cross point. But uh, go to a church and get connected. God bless you. Thank you for watching United with Christ. We pray this has been a blessing to you, and we invite you to tune in again tomorrow. We invite your comments, questions, or prayer requests. You may contact us at KSCE Christian Television, 2201 East Wyoming Avenue, El Paso, Texas, 79903, or call us at 915-532-8588 during regular business hours, or you can visit us on our website at www.kse.com. God bless you.